Hi, my name is Doug Gutschall. I'm a uh, member here of Shoreline Church. I've been working in ministry of some form since the early 80s, and I've been working as a financial advisor and financial planning since uh, the early 90s. There's more scriptures about money than there are about heaven and hell combined, and there's so much wisdom that comes through scripture about financial planning that again, when you apply those principles to your life, uh, you can live a better life. And if your purpose in life is just money, uh, you will be a day late and a dollar short. You will always feel as though uh, you, you don't have enough. So we have two opportunities here at Shoreline Church for you to dive into scripture, for you to have the word of God come alive to you and instruct you. So our first one is January 24th. It's this coming Wednesday night. And we call that uh, Money Management God's Way Triage. It's a one night class where we really compress our five week class into a way to help you get some quick resources if, to stop the bleeding. I mean, that's what triage is for, is to stop the bleeding. Uh, but then we also have an opportunity that starts up the Thursday night after uh, Easter. It's a five-week class, our Money Management God's Way, which is unlike any other class you've been through. It's not a Crown Financial, it's not a Dave Ramsey, it's not a Larry Burkett. It is your Bible and us going through verse by verse, looking at biblical principles that are that are there for us about how we should manage our finances. So those are the two opportunities we have. So we're in a series called A Healthy Life, and today we're talking about growing healthy finances. There's plenty of seminars and books and other resources to help you grow your finances. Today is not going to be a investment seminar. Today I'm not gonna teach you how to get that job that's gonna bring in all the extra wealth. Today we're gonna have a different approach. I searched Amazon.com and found 17,000 books on how to make more money, how to save better, how to invest more successfully. We get advice on how to handle our finances from everywhere. We get advice on how to spend our money from a group of people called advertisers. And you're in church, so of course you get advice on how to spend your money or give your money to the church. If you interact with other nonprofits, other ministries, you get advice from them on where to give your money. But I honestly believe that the most persuasive financial advice we get is from within our own head. I believe that because of how we lived, how we grew up, our, our family dynamic, our financial situation as a child, we have developed a personal financial philosophy. Our, our values, our view of finances is, is shaped by our experiences, the, the good experiences and the bad experiences, but all together that's brought us to where we are today and how we view money and material possessions. My story begins fairly meager. I grew up in a, in a home that was low income. I can remember my parents giving me an envelope and it was full of dimes because I qualified for reduced lunch at school. And they didn't give me a Ziploc bag because I would lose the money in there, but they gave me an envelope that I would take to school full of dimes so I could buy weeks worth of lunches all at once. I remember having hand-me-downs. How many of you have had hand-me-downs? Yeah, how many of you had an older sister that gave you hand-me-downs? <laughs> I vividly remember the purple corduroys with the butterfly patch on the leg. That was my upbringing. I saw my friends around me and all that they had and I wanted it too. I mean, I really did as a small child. I thought there's gotta be an answer, so I looked for it. I grew up on the campus of Michigan State University and in Michigan, cans and bottles were then and are today worth 10 cents when you take them to the recycler. 
After football games, oh, it was good. I would go through all the trash cans, I'd go through all of the lawns, and I would pick up all the bottles and cans, and I'd go return them. At that time, you went to a grocery store to do so, and I would make money. I worked out a deal with the local grocery store. It was called ShopRite. I made a deal with the manager that he would give me a quarter for every shopping cart I returned, those shopping carts that people had taken away. But see, I was really resourceful, so I took some from it and then returned it to him. <laughs> I'm exploring one day as my mom's doing laundry in the laundromat because we didn't have laundry in our home, and I find that when you climb behind the washing machines, oh, a treasure trove of coins <laughs> from what people left in their pockets before doing the laundry. Sometimes there would even be a $5 bill in there. I even found this kiosk in the middle of campus where you could buy stamps. And I'm sure you've had this experience where you put money in a vending machine and it slips out and falls down, well there, there were big cracks in the sidewalk. And I figured out that after the fact, I could go there with a hanger, and I could scoop out the change and have money. Very early on, my financial philosophy was, was molded. It was shaped. The way I viewed money was determined by how I grew up. You see, it was my story, and it was me, and I started thinking in preparation for this that I think a lot of our financial philosophy is me, and is my, and is self-centered. And I know often we say self-centered, it sounds like a really bad thing. I'm not actually saying that. I'm saying motivated by what we know internally. We get a job because we think it's best for my situation. We buy something because we want to enjoy it. We hold off buying something because later on, we want to have the security of having money for other things. But so much of what we do with finances is about our individual self. Even sometimes our giving is that way. We, we give because it makes us feel good sometimes. We give because it makes us look good sometimes. We give because we get a tax benefit sometimes. But so often, how we approach finances is internally motivated. And really today, as opposed to this being an investment seminar, it's about us aligning our hearts with God. It's about us not being internally focused as it comes to finances, but focused on God. Genesis 1 1 says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This may seem like a weird place to start when you're talking about finances, but I really believe this is where we start. Because I believe firmly that creation establishes ownership. I believe that those who create are the owner, and God has created all, which therefore gives him ownership. In Psalm 24, 1, David is writing, we read, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. I mean, that's a very clear statement that there really isn't much that we need to kind of figure out with that. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. I mean, what we're hearing is that everything we have ultimately belongs to God. If God made it, he owns it. So subsequently, how we manage our finances can honor or dishonor God because we're managing his finances, his property, his business. And as I said, the starting place, I really believe, is to align our view of finances with God's view of finances. And the first step I think to achieving like-mindedness with God is to cultivate contentment. And I intentionally use that word cultivate because I don't think it's as simple as just saying, I'm going to be content now. I believe it's much more than that. And living here in this area, either in the Salinas Valley or for us that live on the peninsula very close, we get to see cultivation firsthand Farmers don't just show up in their fields and bam, there's a crop. It takes work. They've got to prepare the soil. They've got to plant the seeds. They've got to water them. For some, they have to cover them from the 
uh, the elements. There's a long process. There's deliberate actions. There's patience. To cultivate contentment takes work. It takes effort. But if we want to align our view of finances with God's view of finances, contentment is the starting point. Why are we discontent anyway? I can say for me that a lot of it is I, I point back to my childhood and how I had so little. And so today I want to have more because I have a greater capacity to have it than I had back then. I think sometimes we excuse ourselves because that's the nature of business or that's the nature of our, our culture. Maybe think, we think we, we need things to, to keep up with other people. But I think if we're really honest, we have to admit that, that our sinful nature has something to do with it. James 4, 1 through 3 says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. I gotta stop right there. I know it's an easy off-ramp to go, hey, I don't kill, so this must not have anything to do with me. But hear the whole story here. You covet, but you cannot get what you want. So you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask. Again, no, I ask all the time. I'm asking God to give. He's still not doing it. Continue on. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives. That you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Whatever the motives are, I am not going to question you and your motives for wanting more, for asking God for more, or how you view your finances. I am going to encourage you, though, to, to turn to God and have him reveal to you what your motives are and how you stand within your finances. Because I really believe that we need to take ownership for what's going on inside us as it applies to our finances. You know, for me, one of the, the difficult things is I like to, to internet shop. It's, it's so easy. I hate stores. You don't ever find me in them. But the internet, I don't have to go anywhere. There's one website in particular that I just love. It's called Woot. And their whole deal is that they have one uh, product every day. One product that they sell, and then when it's out, it's out. And the price is always way below market price. Now they've expanded and they've involved, evolved, so now they have much more than one, but, but they have new products every single day. 10 o'clock at night, for years, I log onto my computer because that's when the new thing comes up on there. I just want to see, what is it? Is it something that I want? Usually the answer is yes. <laughs> but for others, maybe the, the weakness is, is watching television. Is, is seeing what we have others on TV have. Maybe it's seeing the commercials that are there and, and when we see those, we're like, oh, I gotta have that. Maybe for some of us, it's much more personal. When we go to a certain person's house, maybe we find ourselves envying what they have. Maybe their home, their cars, their furnishings. We just thought, oh, it'd be so nice to have that. Maybe we need to pray before we go to that friend's house. Maybe for some of us, while we're at that friend's house, so that we don't grow discontent and envious. But really, to identify those areas of our life is, is useful, is, is helpful, and will allow us to be better equipped to be content if we indeed want contentment? I think that's a very serious question. Do you want to be content? Do you want to be released from the pressure of constantly upgrading or needing to upgrade your life? And if you do, I think the next question is, is it even possible? Is it possible to be driving down the road and have someone in your dream car drive by and you feel grateful for the one 
you're in? Is it possible to be at peace with someone less qualified than you, having a better job and higher pay, and you being satisfied with what you have? Can we actually stop looking at nicer homes, better furnishings, more exotic vacations, and feel okay with what we have without envy taking over? You see, think so often in our lives, we miss out on enjoying what we do have because we spend so much time looking at what we don't. It is possible for us to be content with what we have. And the key is understanding, not, not hearing, not, not knowing it as just some kind of intellectual fact, but fully understanding that the stuff we have isn't ours. It's not ours. We're, we're in the church, we call it being a steward. I don't know anywhere else in the world where they use the word steward, but here in the church, we do. We say we steward God's money. We need good stewardship. It just means caretaking. It means managing. It means that we are managers of what God has entrusted with us. Last Sunday in the reading, I, I put in Matthew 25. For those of you who don't know, in your bulletin every week, there's reading for every day that will help prepare you for the week to come. And so last Sunday, Matthew 25, was, there was a parable about the bags of gold. It was about an owner who entrusted some gold to his servants. He gave one of his servants one bag, one of his servants two bags, and one of his servants five bags. I'm not going to go through the whole thing right now, but to understand that that's the same mentality that happens in our life. And that everything we have, it's God entrusting it to us. And now, just as with those servants, we have to look at what we're going to do with it. How are we going to manage that money? A manager thinks differently than an owner. A steward, someone to, to care for somebody else, has a different approach than an owner does. And I think the Bible reveals some, some shifts in our thinking that I think would be helpful for us. And the first one is going to be a hard one for you to hear. I already know it. And I found it in 1 Timothy 6, 8. And the bottom line is that I think sometimes we need to lower our expectations. 1 Timothy 6, 8, Paul is writing Timothy, and he says, but if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Paul was telling Timothy that we don't need excess. We don't need stockpiles. We don't need to, to even think about next week and the week after. If we have food and clothing, we will be content. This passage is one of three times in the New Testament that we see this one Greek word, archaeo, as it speaks of finances and contentment. Archaeo simply means enough. God's stewards are aware that the basics, the essentials, food and clothing are enough and that it is possible to be content with just the basics. Another shift in our thinking that I think is important is to avoid seeing more income as the answer. I know over my life that that has been a big thing. You know, I started off as a, a guy who was returning cans and bottles, was returning or stealing and returning shopping carts, who was finding change in random places to the big leagues. At age 10, I got a paper route. I was like, oh, now I've got money. Now it's going to be good. And then I moved into being a pizza maker, and then I moved into being a waiter, and each time I thought, now I've got more income. That's the answer, but I don't think it is. Luke 3.14, this is John the Baptist speaking. Then some soldiers asked him, John the Baptist, what should we do? He replied, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. And again, it's easy to say, I'm not falsely accusing people of anything so that I can later blackmail them and then make money so this doesn't apply to me. But I think if that's the case, we miss out 
on the key point here, and that is be content with your pay. Contentment with our pay is not the American way. It just simply isn't. That we have kind of built in that striving for more, seeking raises, seeking new jobs, that is, that's our right. Gaining more financially is our right. And then when we feel financial pressures, and I know we all have at one point, or maybe even do today, that we seem to think that more pay is the answer. As I said, my story, my story started off very meager. I didn't have much as a child. I found ways to just get whatever I could to get by. The truth is, by the time I was a high schooler, I was wealthy. It was amazing. My friends all got like $10, $20 a week allowances. I made $1,500 a month as a waiter in high school. I had so much money, they called me the bank of Keith. (laughs) And that's no joke. By the time I graduated high school, I had a already gone through three cars, a 1965 Mustang, a 1982 IROC, and then I got sensible and I bought a Geo Prism. (laughs) I must say, I still have that 65 Mustang I bought when I was 15. But by then, I had money. I had more disposable income than my parents had when I was in high school. I saved up money, I went away to college. I couldn't get a job. And unfortunately, due to some life choices, when I got a job, I couldn't keep a job. I found myself in debt. I started off relatively poor in life, found myself at a spot where I had some income, some money, some resources, and then again back down. I had debt I had to get out of. I worked hard. I built my way back up to that. Then I got married. Usually when couples get married, they don't have a lot. Man, I was rich when we got married. We had so much money, we didn't know what to do with it. We found ways to spend it, but we, we both had full-time jobs. We had no kids. We had no bills. It was amazing. And then we had a child, and we decided my wife was going to stay home. Back down again. Huge cut in our pay. But ups and downs come through life. So when I talk about finances and getting a handle on it, I get it. I mean, I truly, truly get it. I know it's not easy. That's not a super simple thing to just say, don't think about more money. I have to take this moment to to be clear about something. Seeking a raise, working hard in your job to be recognized to get something more even switching employment to make more money, none of that, none of that is wrong. None of that is sinful. None of that in and of itself is against God's will. So please don't hear that. God wants us to provide for ourselves. God wants us to provide for our family. But it's why we're doing it that I think matters. I think so often we want that next job because we want peace. We want that raise, we want that more income because we want peace. And we need to find peace From God, not from employment, not from money in the bank. Hebrews 13, five says, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. We need to understand that God will be there for us. He's not gonna leave us alone. Often we want those other things because we feel it gives us strength, it gives us security. Philippians 4, 12 and 13 says, I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. Sometimes when I'm reading the Bible, something really speaks to me. I'm like, Paul, I get it. I totally know what it's like to be in need. And I totally know what it's like to have plenty. So I get this. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. If we're seeking on our own to work really hard so that we can get settled and we can be secure and we can have strength, we're missing out. Now here in this passage, Paul uses a different word for contentment than he did in 1 Timothy 6, 8. This one's similar, but it means satisfied. 
As in like you've had a good meal. I'm sure you've had that experience. Sat down at a meal. Maybe you're famished. A couple courses in. If you're, I'm getting a little fuller and then, then you're done. And you're like, oh, that was a good meal. Maybe be at Thanksgiving or Christmas. Or maybe you're out at a restaurant and you've just had a good meal. You're content. You're satisfied. Until the waiter or waitress comes and says, who wants dessert? <laughs> then all of a sudden, well, maybe I got a little bit more room. But that's how it is with us. We can get beyond satisfied into where we want just a little bit more. I like illustrations. And uh, I've had a couple of quarters in my pocket that I've been playing with. Uh, I read this story about this boy who was talking to his dad, and his dad gave him two quarters. He said, son, one quarter, I want you to put in the offering in Sunday school. And, and one quarter, I want you to use to, to get an ice cream cone. Remember when ice cream was a quarter? Yeah. Man, used to love that at Thrifty. Anyway, he was going, walking down, getting excited about his ice cream cone, playing with his quarters, and he dropped one. And it rolled down the gutter, and just out of his grasp, it went down into the storm drain. He looked, much as I looked in all the different places to find money, and wondered, is there any way for me to get that? And after looking down for a moment, he realized, no. So he looked up to where he thought he'd be looking at God, and he said, God, I'm so sorry. I dropped your quarter down the drain. <laughs> and then he went and got an ice cream. That is a funny story, but I think it's our story all too often. And we don't understand that both quarters are God's. Both came from him. He cares about what we give to the church. He gives about what we give to charity. He cares about what we spend on stuff for ourselves. He cares about it all. God's entrusted us with his money. And we've got to understand that that should be the way we approach it. And it's God's money, and we want to do it, do with it the way he would have us do with it. And I think the reason this pertains in this situation is because we often say within a church, all right, here comes the pastor's pitch. Give the church money. We tell you every week that we really believe that this is God's plan is for the church body to support the work of the church. I hope that's nothing new to you, that you've heard that here before. If this is your first time you heard it today, that this is, this is part of what we do. But it's so much more than that. I think it's an important thing for us to look at how we spend all of the money that God gives us. And I think we have three choices. We can live beyond our means, which I did at a time and had tons of debt. I think we can live within our means, which is how much money we have, that's what we spend. And I think we would mostly look at that as that's the responsible thing to do. But while I'm being bold this morning, I'm gonna suggest why not live below our means? Why don't we allow in our finances margin to do something more? Why don't we see what we make, what we have as income, and make a choice to spend less than that. Because then that opens up the door for us to look for opportunities to be generous. Generosity can reveal itself in lots of different ways. Some of it is just giving to God's work here on this earth. Some of it is supporting nonprofit organizations. Some of it's supporting people in your life. But if we don't have available resources because we've lived at our means or beyond our means, we have nothing left to share. James 1.22 says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Every time. Every time I have a chance to get up in front of an audience of any kind, whether it's my kids, a Sunday school group, or 
a church body. I always want to have a call to action. I feel that we will fail if we come in here and we hear a message, we hear some biblical truth, and then we leave here the same as we walked in. We've got to do stuff different. We've got to take action. Back to the bulletin where I said there is the weekly reading. We've also put in there, as we do every single week, a prayer direction and a limit challenge. The prayer direction says, thank God for blessings in your life, both material and non-material. Ask God to show you where your view of finances differ from his view. Pray for your heart, perspective, and actions to more closely align with God's will for your finances. This week, I, I, I encourage you, please turn your finances over to God. If this is something you've been doing for a long time, great, keep it going. Do it maybe even more. Allow God to direct how you handle your finances, both that which you spend on you and your family and those around you, and that which you give away and give it away. That's the live it challenge. Give something away this week. The reality is that for some of us, it's gonna be something small. It might be big in meaning. I spoke to someone earlier today who said, I know what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna give away a Bible that I have to a young lady who could really use it. I thought, how cool is that? She doesn't have a lot of financial resources. She doesn't have a lot to give, but she has a Bible to give. Pray. Ask God what that would be and actually do it. I'd encourage you not to negotiate with him either. When God puts something on your heart, just just do it. And then just see what God will do with that and how God will honor that. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you. I mean, I really am grateful for the financial journey I've been on and how I believe I've been able to align more closely, sometimes closer than others, with your will for finances. I pray for me and each person hearing that you would allow us the privilege of seeing finances the way you do, of managing our finances the way you would have us manage it because it's your, it's yours all the way through. I pray that you would use this church body in an amazing way to show what it means to to be caretakers of your resources, that you would use this church body to change the world. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.